not to be a pop star. I enjoy it. How do you feel when you get all these girls screaming and shouting? Yeah, it's great. Girls screaming at a concert and not for somebody else. You know, it's same, just a measure of success, but it is great anyway. Obviously, you feel a personal pride. We were in a bloody tornado all the time. The band in 1963 played over 300 gigs. When you come on stage, a whole crowd just pour forward. Brian, oh, do you one of the original members? Yes. He was brilliant. He was a brilliant musician. He shocked everybody with the quality of his playing. Brian Jones, a musical pioneer and versatile instrumentalist, served as a profound source of inspiration for the Rolling Stones during their formative years. His innovative spirit and diverse musical talents laid the groundwork for the band's early success. No matter what anyone says, rock on. We're diving deep into the history of the Rolling Stones with a twist. We're focusing on the underappreciated genius of Brian Jones. We're about to count down the top 10 greatest Rolling Stones songs where Brian Jones' influence shines the brightest. It's Brian with a slide. See, he's doing it. We'll be talking bluesy riffs mind-bending melodies, and the unexpected psychedelic flourishes that defined his playing. The Rolling Stones' Street Fighting Man is a sonic explosion, a gritty anthem for a generation in political and social turmoil. But beneath the driving rhythm and Mick Jagger's incendiary vocals lies a subtle yet significant contribution from Brian Jones, the band's often overlooked multi-instrumentalist. While Jones's role in Street Fighting Man might not be as flashy as Keith Richards' bass line or Charlie Watts' drumming, it's no less crucial. Jones weaves a haunting soundscape with two distinct instruments, the sitar and the tampara. The sitar, a stringed instrument from India, provides a droning melody throughout the song. Its sustained notes create a sense of unease and tension, perfectly mirroring the atmosphere of social unrest depicted in the lyrics. Jones' mastery of the instrument adds a layer of worldliness and psychedelia, pushing the boundaries of the stone's sound beyond traditional rock and roll. The tanpura, another Indian instrument, is less prominent but equally important. It provides a low, constant drone that acts as the foundation for the song's sonic tapestry. Hey! This drone serves two purposes. First, it creates a sense of hypnotic rhythm, subtly driving the song forward. Second, it adds a layer of fullness to the sound, making the song feel richer and more immersive. Street Fighting Man holds a bittersweet significance for Brian Jones. It was one of the final songs he played a major role in before his departure from the band in 1969. His contribution, though subtle, serves as a testament to his ability to incorporate diverse musical influences into the Stones' sound, pushing them towards a more experimental and global direction. Brian Jones's work on Street Fighting Man may not be the loudest or most obvious element of the song, yet his haunting Cedar melody and the subtle thrum of the Tan Pura create a foundation of unease and tension that perfectly complements the song's message. It's a reminder 
that Brian Jones' influence on the Rolling Stones wasn't just about raw power, it was about creating a tapestry of sound that resonated on a deeper level. Well, I'm a king, babe. Buzzing around your house. The Rolling Stones' 1964 debut album wasn't just a collection of covers. It was a declaration of their unwavering love for blues music. Well, I'm a king, babe, baby. Buzzing around your house. One such example is their electrifying rendition of Slim Harpo's I'm a King Bee, where Brian Jones takes center stage with a scorching slide guitar performance. I'm a King Bee. Known as the band's resident blues enthusiast, Jones was a natural fit for I'm a King Bee. While the arrangement remained faithful to Harpo's version, Jones injected his own fire into the song with a searing slide guitar solo. Sting it, band. This technique, where a bottleneck or slide is used to press down on the strings, creates a wailing, expressive sound that perfectly embodies the song's braggadocious attitude. Well, I'm a king, man. Jones's contributions weren't limited to the solo. Some accounts suggest he might have also played the harmonica parts alongside Mick Jagger, further solidifying the song's bluesy foundation. His ability to seamlessly blend his love for the genre with the band's burgeoning rock and roll energy is a key element of what makes the song so captivating. While Mick Jagger himself jokingly questioned the need for their version after hearing Slim Harpo's original, Brian Jones's contribution to I'm a King Bee is undeniable. It showcases his talent as a musician, his deep connection to the blues, and his lasting influence on the sound of the Rolling Stones. The impact of Jones's slide guitar on I'm a King B extends beyond the song itself. Well, I'm a king, baby, baby. It became a signature sound for the early Stones, influencing future tracks like Little Red Rooster and inspiring countless guitarists to explore the technique. Once again, the Rolling Stones singing. What is the title of this? It's called <laughs> Not, Not, Not. Fade Away. The Rolling Stones' Not Fade Away is a high-octane rock and roll anthem, a cover song that quickly became a staple of their early live performances. <laughs> While Mick Jagger's vocals and Keith Richards' driving guitar riff take center stage, the foundation for this raw energy is laid by Brian Jones with his wailing harmonica. Brian Jones was the driving force behind the Stones' embrace of blues music. His admiration for artists like Muddy Waters and Little Walter directly influenced the band's early sound. So, when it came to Not Fade Away, a song originally by Buddy Holly and the Crickets, Jones saw an opportunity to channel his blues roots and inject the cover with a dose of authenticity. Jones's harmonica playing on Not Fade Away is nothing short of electrifying. He utilizes a technique known as harp bending where the harmonica is manipulated to create expressive pitch changes. These bends and wails perfectly embody the song's youthful frustration and yearning for excitement, adding a layer of rawness that complements the driving rhythm section. Of course, Not Fade Away isn't a one-man show. Keith Richards' iconic guitar riff provides the backbone of the song. While Charlie Watts' drumming 
propels it forward with relentless energy. Mick Jagger's vocals, both lead and backing, add another layer of youthful urgency. Well, love is love and I made a way. However, Jones's harmonica sets the tone from the very beginning, establishing the song's bluesy foundation and raw attitude. And your love for me has got to be real. His ability to breathe life into the blues through his harmonica playing helped shape the band's early identity and solidify their place as one of the leading rock and roll forces of the 1960s. While Brian Jones's time with the Stones might have been cut short, the electrifying harmonica intro and throughout Not Fade Away serves as a lasting reminder of his blues passion and his crucial role in establishing the band's raw and energetic sound. Hey! Hey! Brian Jones's harmonica work on Not Fade Away transcended the song itself. It became a signature sound for the early Stones, influencing countless future tracks like 2120 South Michigan Avenue and Prodigal Son. We wanted to do a blues and everybody said, don't do it because you, you'll destroy your career. No one's ever done a blues record for a single in England. You know, it's the worst thing. Like they said to Ray Charles, don't do a country album because it'll destroy you. And it was the greatest thing he ever did. Well, when we did Little Red Rooster, they said, you know, you're gonna kill yourself. It, it came out on the Friday and on the Monday it was number one. Little Red Rooster. Jones, a passionate blues devotee, was instrumental in bringing the song to the Stones. It's Brian with the slide. He, he, he's doing it. Originally a Howlin' Wolf composition, Little Red Rooster resonated deeply with Jones's love for the genre's rawness and storytelling. <laughs> His enthusiasm was contagious, and the band embraced the song, transforming it into a cornerstone of their early sound. However, it's Jones's scorching slide guitar playing that truly elevates. I am the little red rooster. What, what is anybody else doing? He's making the song. Little Red Rooster, using a bottleneck or slide to create a wailing, expressive tone, Jones injects the song with a soulful urgency that mirrors the rooster's defiance. His solo isn't about technical prowess, it's about raw motion, perfectly complementing the song's swagger and grit. While the slide guitar remains the centerpiece of Jones' contribution, there might be more to his story on this track. I am the little red Too late. Some sources suggest he might have also played harmonica on the recording. Adding another layer of bluesy texture, this further demonstrates his dedication to staying true to the song's roots while infusing it with the Stones' rock and roll energy. Brian Jones' work on Little Red Rooster transcended the song itself. It solidified his reputation as a master of slide guitar. Little Red Rooster's on the prowl. His ability to bridge the gap between blues tradition and rock and roll innovation became a defining characteristic of the band's early sound. Little Red Rooster serves as a powerful reminder of Brian Jones's musical genius and his lasting impact on the Rolling Stones' legacy. He may not have crowed the loudest vocally, but his slide guitar ensured his solo soared on this iconic track. I am the Little Red Rooster. Too late.
The Rolling Stones' Little Red Rooster isn't just a blues cover, it's a masterclass in translating the genre's raw energy into a rock and roll anthem. We ain't had no peace in the barnyard since that little red rooster came home. A significant portion of this transformation can be attributed to Brian Jones, the band's multi-instrumentalist, and in this case, the Sultan of Slide Guitar. The Rolling Stones' Let's Spend the Night Together is a rock and roll classic. Driven by a thumping rhythm and Mick Jagger's suggestive vocals, the song caused a stir upon release due to its perceived boldness. Don't you worry if that was on your mind, no man. However, nestled beneath the song's swagger lies a subtle yet significant contribution from Brian Jones, who often played a more understated role. Let's spend the night together now. While Keith Richards takes center stage with his electric guitars on Let's Spend the Night Together, it's Brian Jones on the organ that provides the song's foundation. His playing isn't flashy or virtuosic. Instead, it's a steady, rhythmic groove that locks in perfectly with Charlie Watts' drumming. This groove creates a bed of warm tones that underpins the entire song, propelling it forward with a subtle energy. Let's spend the night together marked a slight departure from the Stones' earlier blues-infused sound. The song's prominent piano and organ, played by Jones and session musician Jack Nitsche, respectively, showcased a more keyboard-driven approach. Let's spend the night together Now I need you more than ever Jones's contribution here demonstrates his adaptability as a musician, seamlessly integrating himself into the evolving sound of the band. It's important to remember that Let's Spend the Night Together is a product of the entire band's creative energy. Mick Jagger's vocals are undeniably captivating. Keith Richards' guitar work adds a layer of rock and roll grit. However, Jones's subtle yet essential role on the organ serves as a crucial element that holds the song together. Brian Jones's contribution to Let's Spend the Night Together might not be the first thing listeners notice, but it's undeniable nonetheless. His tasteful organ playing provides the song's rhythmic foundation, showcasing his ability to adapt to the band's evolving sound and adding a layer of texture that goes unnoticed but deeply felt. Now I need you, now I have The Rolling Stones' No Expectations, a melancholic gem from their 1968 album Beggar's Banquet, holds a special significance in the band's history. Not only does it capture a shift in their sound towards a more introspective and psychedelic direction, but it also marks one of Brian Jones' final significant contributions to the group before his departure. Jones, the band's multi-instrumentalist, known for his love of blues and experimentation, shines on no expectations with his mournful slide guitar playing. This technique, where a bottleneck or slide is used to create a wailing, expressive sound, perfectly complements the song's atmosphere of disillusionment and longing. Jones's slide guitar weaves a haunting melody 
that intertwines beautifully with Keith Richards's acoustic rhythm guitar, creating a sense of emotional depth rarely heard in the Stone's earlier work. Take me to the station. While the slide guitar is Jones's most prominent contribution, it's important to remember No Expectations is a collaborative effort. Nicky Hopkins adds a layer of melancholic piano. And Charlie Watts's subtle drumming provides a steady heartbeat to the song. However, Jones's performance stands out as a pointing out farewell a final expression poured into his instrument as his personal struggles and declining role in the band intensified. No Exceptions became a turning point for the Rolling Stones, marking their foray into a more experimental and introspective sound. Yes, I want you to leave in me. However, for Brian Jones, it serves as a bittersweet reminder of his immense talent and his crucial role in shaping the band's early years. His slide guitar performance on the song isn't just a musical moment. It's a haunting farewell from a founding member whose influence continues to resonate within the Stones' legacy. He just finds a flute, and he finds a little thing he can play on it. His versatility knows no bounds as he picks up the recorder for Ruby Tuesday. Or in the darkest night, no one knows. First time I'd ever heard that kind of music or felt that kind of feeling, it was just, just amazing. Yeah, a whole new feeling came over me that I'd never felt before. The Rolling Stones' Ruby Tuesday is a melancholic ballad, a stark contrast to their usual brand of bluesy rock and roll. She would never say where she came from. The song's gentle melody and introspective lyrics resonated with fans and critics alike, becoming a number one hit in the U.S. However, the story behind Ruby Tuesday goes beyond its chart success, and it's a story where Brian Jones, the band's multi-instrumentalist, plays a crucial yet often overlooked role. Yesterday don't matter if it's gone. The genesis of Ruby Tuesday began with Brian's experimentation. He surprised his bandmates by playing a wispy, melancholic tune on the recorder an instrument not typically associated with rock and roll. While the sun is bright. Keith Richards, captivated by the melody, urged Brian to repeat it. This became the foundation of the song. Or in the darkest night, no one knows. While Brian undeniably provided the spark, Ruby Tuesday blossomed through collaboration. Richards fleshed out the melody on piano, and together, they built the song's structure. Brian's influence extended beyond the initial melody. He played the recorder on the final recording, adding a signature layer of whimsy. He even contributed to the piano parts. She just can't be chained. Despite his significant contributions, Brian was not given a songwriting credit. This has been a source of contention among fans and some within the band itself. Question why she needs to be so free. Brian's girlfriend at the time, Marianne Faithful, claimed he wrote an early version of the melody. Goodbye, Ruby Tuesday. Keith Richards acknowledged Brian's role in crafting the music, though downplaying his lyrical contribution. The story of Ruby Tuesday 
is a bittersweet reminder of Brian Jones' multifaceted talent. Though not traditionally seen as a songwriter, his musical intuition and willingness to experiment were crucial to the song's creation. He'd pick up a flute or just anything that was handy and just create something out of it which wasn't there originally. And it, it, it embellished the song so much that it became the catch. Can you hear him? She comes and goes. Brian Jones' work on Ruby Tuesday showcases his versatility as a musician. He wasn't just a blues enthusiast, he was a player who embraced diverse instrumentation and sounds. He just finds a flute and he finds a little thing he can play on it. The haunting melody he created on the recorder became the heart of the song, setting it apart from the Stones' other work. While a songwriting credit might have been omitted, Jones's influence on Ruby Tuesday remains undeniable. Still, I'm gonna miss you. His contribution serves as a testament to his enduring legacy as a creative force within the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones weren't just a band churning out bluesy rock and roll anthems. Tracks like Lady Jane showcased their willingness to experiment and incorporate unexpected sounds. In this psychedelic gem, Brian Jones, the band's multi-instrumentalist and sonic alchemist, takes center stage with a unique contribution, the dulcimer. My sweet Lady Jane. In the mid-60s, the British rock scene was buzzing with psychedelic exploration. The Stones, never one to shy away from innovation, jumped on board with Lady Jane. And will humbly remain. While Mick Jagger's lyrics hinted at Elizabethan romance, it was Brian Jones's choice of instrument that truly set the song apart. Lady Jane. The dulcimer, a plucked string instrument with a haunting sound, imbued Lady Jane with a distinctly baroque feel. Jones, known for his quick learning abilities, reportedly mastered the instrument just in time for recording. Jones' contribution to Lady Jane goes beyond the dulcimer's prominent melody. Some sources claim he might have also played the harpsichord, a keyboard instrument that further emphasized the song's historical vibe. This layering of sounds with the dulcimer's unique twang juxtaposed against the harpsichord's regal tones created a rich tapestry that perfectly complemented the song's lyrical themes. I pledge my to Lady Jane. Lady Jane is not just a Brian Jones showcase. Keith Richards' acoustic guitar provides a steady foundation, while Charlie Watts' subtle drumming keeps the song grounded. However, it's Jones's willingness to embrace the unfamiliar, the melancholic beauty of the dulcimer that elevates Lady Jane to a different sonic plane. Brian Jones' work on Lady Jane serves as a testament to his boundless creativity and his crucial role in pushing the boundaries of the Rolling Stones sound. He wasn't just a guitarist. He was a musical explorer who dared to incorporate unexpected instruments into the band's music. My sweet lady Jane, when I see you again, your servant am I, 
and will humbly remain. The haunting melody of the dulcimer on Lady Jane became a signature moment, a reminder of the band's willingness to experiment and leave their blues roots behind. Just heed this plea, my love, on bended knees, my love, I pledge myself to Lady Jane. While Brian Jones's time with the Stones might have been cut short, his influence on their music, particularly on their embrace of psychedelia, remains undeniable. The Rolling Stones' Under My Thumb isn't just a swaggering rock anthem. It's a showcase of the band's willingness to experiment with unexpected sounds. A crucial contributor to this sonic tapestry is Brian Jones, architect of sonic textures. Under my thumb, the girl who... While Mick Jagger's lyrics boast about control, it's Jones's distinctive use of the marimba that truly sets the song apart. The early Rolling Stones were known for their blues-infused sound. However, Under My Thumb, released in 1966 on the Aftermath album, marked a shift towards a more experimental approach. The girl who once pushed me around. Jones, always eager to explore new sounds, embraced the marimba, a wooden mallet percussion instrument with a distinctive bright sound. His incorporation of the marimba on Under My Thumb added a layer of unexpected texture, creating a unique sonic landscape that complemented the song's lyrical themes of dominance and control. Is that me? Jones's marimba playing on Under My Thumb isn't relegated to mere background ambiance. His rhythmic marimba line becomes the song's most prominent melody, driving the song forward with a hypnotic pulse. This distinctive sound perfectly complements the fuzz bass line and Keith Richards' distorted guitar, creating a sense of urgency and tension that mirrors the lyrics. Of course, Under My Thumb isn't a one-man show. Mick Jagger's vocals ooze with bravado, while Keith Richards' guitar work provides a layer of rock and roll grit. Charlie Watts' drumming keeps the song grounded, and Bill Wyman's bass line adds a low and growl. Under my Brian Jones work on Under My Thumb. He wasn't just a musician, he was a sonic explorer who dared to incorporate unexpected sounds into the Stones' music. The driving melody he created on the marimba became a signature element of the song, influencing countless future artists to explore the instrument's unique sonic possibilities. He's under my thumb. While Brian Jones's time with the Stones might have been short-lived, his innovative use of the marimba on Under My Thumb serves as a testament to his enduring legacy. It's a reminder of his boundless creativity and his crucial role in pushing the boundaries of the Rolling Stones' sound. Paint It Black is a psychedelic masterpiece. Its haunting melody, driving rhythm, and Mick Jagger's brooding vocals have cemented its place as a timeless rock anthem. However, beneath the song's dark exterior lies a crucial contribution from Brian Jones, the band's multi-instrumentalist whose role is often overshadowed. While Mick Jagger and Keith Richards are credited as songwriters for Paint It Black, the song's origins lie in Brian Jones' experimentation. During the Stones' initial sessions for Aftermath at RCA Studios, their pianist and road manager Ian Stewart managed to get Brian his own sitar. Soon after, a fortuitous encounter with sitar virtuoso Hariha Rao led Brian to become his student. I met him in a club in New York, Brian recalled. Hari taught me how to play the sitar. He studied under Ravi Shankar for 12 years, 
yet he still considers himself a student. These people dedicate their lives to the instrument. I see a as I want it into black. While Brian hadn't mastered the sitar, he recognized its potential within the Stones' music. I love the instrument, he said. It offers a new range if you incorporate it into your music. It operates on completely different principles from the guitar and opens up new possibilities for a group in terms of harmonics and everything. In December 1965, Brian had been inspired by George Harrison's sitar playing on Norwegian wood from the Beatles' Rubber Soul album. We talked until two, and then she said, it's time for bed. Norwegian wood is the first song that ever had a sitar on it and it wasn't a casual throwaway like George it implies in his book it was I asked him can you play this lick on the sitar and he took 20 minutes or half an hour to get the lick down so I lit a fire isn't it good no we do As the Stones explored the Eastern influences in Painted Black, Brian skillfully used the sitar, playing the vocal melody in the verses and providing the song with its distinctive and ominous intro riff. Oldham remarked, It was more than just decoration. Sometimes Brian was the glue that held the whole record together. <laughs> This improvisation, fueled by the sitar's unique droning sound, became the foundation for the song's now iconic melody. Jones's contribution to Painted Black goes beyond the sitar. <laughs> Some sources claim he also played acoustic guitar on the track, adding a layer of texture that complements the driving rhythm section. Additionally, his keen ear for arrangement likely influenced the song's overall structure, with its contrasting sections of Eastern-influenced melody and bluesy rock urgency. Despite his substantial contributions, Jones was not credited as a songwriter for Paint It Black. This remains a point of contention among some fans who argue that Jones's role in shaping the song's core melody deserves recognition. Bass pedals. There's Brian. Paint It Black hit the shelves a month after Aftermath, making its debut on May 7th in the US and on the 13th in the UK quickly rising to the top of the charts in both countries. It would be another two years before the Rolling Stones would celebrate another number one single. I see my red door and have it into black. Brian Jones's work on Paint It Black exemplifies his talent for incorporating unexpected sounds into the Rolling Stones' music. The sitar's haunting melody became a defining element of the song pushing the boundaries of rock and roll and paving the way for further experimentation within the genre. While a songwriting credit might have been omitted, Jones's influence on Paint It Black remains undeniable. His contribution serves as a testament to his enduring legacy as a creative force within the Rolling Stones. Don't get angry with me. Thanks for watching. Until then, rock on and keep it rolling. He don't know if it's right or wrong. Maybe he 
should tell someone He's not sure just what it was Or if it's against the law Something